the body does have a breaking point where the compensatory mechanisms are no longer effective. It is reported that loss of greater than 40% of blood or plasma volume will result in um, ineffective compensatory mechanisms. So as an example, in a 10 kilogram dog bleeding into an abdomen, for, perhaps from a hit by a car, the blood volume of a 10 kilogram dog is roughly 8% of the body weight or 800 mils. So 40% loss of the 800 mils is 320 mils uh, into the abdomen will result in defective compensatory mechanism response. When the compensatory mechanisms have been exhausted, shock will not be corrected and medical attention, um, timely medical attention would be needed. So there are different phases of shock and these discrete phases are based on physiologic changes. These phases work along a continuum and so certainly some of them may not be um, as easily identifiable or the, or the passing of one into another may, may not be easily identifiable. The phases known are the compensated phase of shock in which the body's compensatory mechanisms are compensating for shock and clinical signs are typically those of the hyperdynamic phase. When the compensatory mechanisms they start to fail, then we go into decompensatory phase of shock. And then terminal shock is when the blood itself can no longer be distributed to the vital organs like the brain and the heart. Again, these clinical signs vary within the phases, and the prognosis dependent is dependent on the phase in which your patients are in prognosis being better, obviously, with compensated shock of phase of shock and poor with terminal shock. Therapy of shock is based on the assessment and severity. There's always a hypophilemic component, perhaps with the exception of cardiogenic shock itself. So the foundation of therapy is usually to try to increase the intravascular volume with the aim of restoring blood volume and oxygen delivery to all tissues. There's a concept called the time is tissue where the early correction of abnormal perfusion will hopefully prevent multiple organ failure and improve the survival of our patients. The mainstay of therapy um, in shock is going to be restoring intravascular volume by fluids. The most common fluids we have available would be crystalloids, synthetic colloids, hypertonic saline solutions, and blood products. When we're talking about these fluids, not only will we be talking about the advantages and disadvantages, but also their known effects on the immune and inflammatory system. So with crystalloids, examples that are most commonly used would include plasma light A or isolite S, normal cell R. They're all within the same category. Lactated ringers and 0.9% saline. The composition of these crystalloids are the electrolytes that can easily pass through the vessels. The advantages of crystalloids are that they're inexpensive. They have a long shelf life. They're the only fluid that will correct dehydration as 80% of the crystalloid delivered will filter out within one hour. So this little diagram is meant to depict the two red lines encompassing the intravascular space and then these are cells in the interstitial space. So when crystalloids are administered they can expand the intravascular space however again 80% of these crystalloids will filter out and then ultimately resulting in a reduced intravascular space. Crystalloid disadvantages is again if you remember the goal of hypovolemic resuscitation is to restore blood volume and improve oxygen delivery. If the crystalloids filter out too quickly then this goal is negated. Some of the disadvantages of crystalloids also would be that they are the ones that we commonly use are pro-inflammatory. The ones that have been found to potentially help with ameliorating the inflammatory and immune uh, pathologic immune response is LRS, but uh, the racemic form of LRS is, does not have an advantage. We'd have to look for 
the D isomer only. It is available, uh, I, I believe, through Baxter, but not commonly used in veterinary medicine at this time. With crystalloids, you also have to take caution with patients that are intolerant to interstitial fluid accumulation. That can result in edema, so patients like those with cardiac disease can result in heart failure, aggressive fluid therapy with crystalloids with respiratory disease um, can result in pulmonary edema, and then neurologic patients as well, like head trauma. So although the concept of shock rates of crystalloids are falling out of favor, you will still find published that the shock rate of crystalloid delivery in dogs is roughly 100 mils per kilo per hour, and in cats, half of that at 50 mils per kilo per hour. We do still use these rates, but probably not at the same uh, concept that would be published like uh, like a, a flat rate. So as an example, in a 5 kilo cat in decompensa decompensatory hy hypovolemic shock, you can go at 50 mils per kilo per hour, so you can start at 250 mils per hour, but you have to reassess in 10 to 15 minutes. You can't leave it at this rate indefinitely, as it'll likely lead to complications with over fluid overload. After the 10 to 15 minute period, you have to reassess your patients and tailor their rate in response to your resuscitation efforts. If you're combining crystalloids with colloids, you can decrease the dose by 50 to 60 percent. So synthetic colloids available examples include penistarch in Canada, dextrans, hetastarch in the States, and the hemoglobin-based oxygen carrying solutions which are available through emergency drug release. The composition of colloids are that they are large, synthetic, negatively charged molecules that do not easily pass through vessels. Given that they don't easily pass through vessels, the advantage is that you can deliver a lower volume of fluid. So these colloid molecules that are being delivered, they'll tend to stay within the vessels, drawing water and restoring intravascular volume. The duration of volume expansion in healthy animals can be up to 24 hours and is less known with critically ill or tra traumatized animals. Colloid disadvantages include higher doses associated, can be associated with bleeding tendencies. When our patients have an inflammatory component resulting in vasculitis, the inflamed vessels can then result in um, larger uh, intercellular binds and causing it can cause them to be a little bit leakier. So in these instances, it's a potential that the colleagues then can escape from the vessels and then you get a reverse effect by drawing the fluids into the interstitial space. Given this possibility, college should be used with extreme caution in cardiac patients that are intolerant to fluid overload, renal failure, head trauma, and lung disease. The colloids in their position of the inflammatory and immune response are equivocal. There are some beneficial effects and um, some, some effects that do actually promote inflammation. At this time, in military, in the military, 6% head of starch is the ther main therapy of used. So we'll touch a little bit on hypertonic saline. To give you an idea of how concentrated hypertonic saline can be, normal saline is usually at a concentration of 0.9%. Hypertonic saline can vary between 3 to 7.5%. Higher concentrations can be found. However, they should be diluted prior to deliver, being delivered. The composition of this fluid then certainly is that there's a higher concentration of sodium. Sodium being still an electrolyte can easily pass through the vessels. The mechanism of action of hypertonic saline is that with a higher sodium concentration, you can draw fluid from the interstitial space into the intravascular space to again help increase intravascular volume. However, with time, these sodium molecules will leave the intravascular space and water will follow. 
contraindications for hypertonic saline include dehydration, as the mechanism of action is dependent on the ability for water to be drawn from the interstitial space into the intravascular space, and also hypernatremia. Finally, we'll talk about blood products. Examples of blood products available include fresh or stored whole blood, packed red blood cells, plasma products, and platelet products. Indications for blood products include uncontrolled ongoing bleeding, to increase the oxygen carrying capacity if the red blood cell mass has been diluted through volume resuscitation, and if there are coagulation factor deficiencies. Coagulation factors can be provided through fresh frozen plasma or fresh whole blood. When considering fluid resuscitation in trauma and hemorrhage, concepts the concept of more fluid equating to more bleeding has to be kept in mind as indiscriminate fluid administration may exasperate hemorrhage. This is done through diluting the clotting factors that are within the body. It can disrupt the clots that have already been formed. You decrease blood viscosity and you'll also increase perfusion pressure. This has led to the concept of hypotensive resuscitation with hemorrhagic patients. So hypotensive resuscitation is achieving resuscitation through goal direction. And our targets would be to maintain a mean arterial pressure between 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury and systolic blood pressure between 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury if maps are not measurable. Other targets can include improving mentations or the ability to then palpate a dorsal pedal pulse. Even though hypotensive resuscitation is recommended with hypo, with hemorrhagic shock, definitive control of the hemorrhage is recommended to be sought within eight hours as prolonged hypotension can result in multiple organ failure. Besides our modes of fluid resuscitation, general supportive care should also be considered, including pain medications with careful titration of opioids, supplemental flow by oxygen, and keeping our patients warm and dry. Finally, with controversial issues with shock, the debate of whether crystalloids or colloids are advantageous are still ongoing. At this time, there's no clear-cut answer. And as stated previously, the military at this time uses 6% head of starch as their main fluid of choice. The literature available currently suggests that perhaps LRS containing only the L isomer may be beneficial. Other controversies include the ideal fresh frozen plasma to packed red blood cell ratios and massive hemorrhage. It's not as common to run into this situation in veterinary medicine. However, higher ratios are associated with improved outcomes. So instead of transfusing only one fresh frozen plasma to every five to six packed red blood cell transfusion, our human counterparts are going towards a ratio of one to one or one to two. Perhaps the most controversial issue with trauma and hemorrhage in veterinary medicine regards, is in regards to steroid use. There are no literature that could be found regarding the, and the old notion that steroids will stabilize uh, cell membranes. So in terms of steroids use, there are beneficials, uh, beneficials to uh, using them with relative adrenal insufficiency with critical illness. With relative adrenal insufficiency, however, we're usually talking about using steroids in fully resuscitated patients. And also the dose used is typically 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone. And if we say that an average human is 70 kilograms and that dexamethasone, for example, is known to be about 40 times as potent as hydrocortisone, then typically that will result in a dose of 0.02 mg per kg of dexamethasone in a fully resuscitated dog or cat. If you're suspecting relative adrenal insufficiency, these doses are very small and not typically what is used in veterinary medicine. Other potentials for steroid uh, use in the future may be that 
studies have shown that females tend to survive trauma better than males do, and so perhaps there is a possibility of using estradiol in these issue in these um, situations. Thank you so much.